So today we're here talking with Shelly Jones, who's the executive director of Survivors of Blue Suicide Foundation. And uh, Shelly, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show today. Hey, I very much appreciate the opportunity. So you have a, um, it's a really unique organization, I think, in, in, in your mission and some of the services they provide. Let's start with, uh, tell us about the organization, who started it, and, and why it got started in the first place. Well, about three years ago, um, the National Board of Concerns of Police Survivors, who handles line of duty deaths, um, they work with the families and coworkers after a line of duty death. Um, they started talking about how they could help the families of officers who die by suicide. They don't define line of duty death and they don't decide which uh, deaths are considered line of duty. But they um, also recognize that suicide is not considered line of duty death. Right. Well, after uh, uh, some serious discussion and taking a look at everything, they decided that they didn't have the capacity to literally triple in size. And so they decided and voted in January of 2020 to help start a new separate organization. And that's how Survivors of Blue Suicide came about because of the gracious hearts of the COPS membership and COPS National Board. Yeah, they're a, they're a great, great organization. Um, they absolutely are. You know, and when you look at, when you look at numbers, uh, my understanding is we're at almost, we're somewhere around a hundred officers so far for 2021 for suicides. Is yes. That correct. Am I close with that? And then, and, and then historically we've seen numbers equaling or greater than our line of duty death numbers. Uh, yes. Which is right. I think people don't realize that. Yes. I, um, Man, so so I, with my background being uh, with the Law Enforcement Memorial Association in Minnesota, um, I've, I've got a lot of experience working with survivor families for, for, for line of duty death funerals and working and supporting those families and knowing the, the, the kind of support that we provide to those families throughout the year and every year, um, you think about, it really got me thinking about the the families of, of officers that we've lost to suicide and, and who do they have for support? You know, who's there for them? Um, I just think that's uh, just a big void. It's they're they're kind of the forgotten families. If, I mean, does that make sense? I, that's the way it seems to me. Yes. They've, they've been left um, to their own defenses, basically. Um, right. There has been very little help out there for the families. Um, locally, you might get a little bit, and some agencies do a really, really good job of taking care of those families. Some of them give them an honorable funeral, um, literally a, a, what is defined as a line of duty death funerals. But other agencies have said, uh, you can't attend the funeral on, uh, on the clock. If you go to the funeral, you can't wear a uniform and you have to take vacation time. So that's the spectrum and we're trying to change that. That's one of our missions, uh, our goals of working with the agencies to say, hey, let's give these folks an honorable, fa uh, honorable funeral. They, they've earned it. Um, their family has sacrificed. They've given up their holidays. They've given up um, their family time, um, all the special occasions those officers have missed. These families have sacrificed and a, a lot of the suicides are due to the traumas of the job. Right. Because the traumas aren't addressed, um, they, um, they get worse and worse. And some of them eventually uh, die by suicide. Right. And we're working to try and keep that from happening um, through what we call postvention. Um, we work with the agencies to help navigate the aftermath basically of a suicide. And so I, I, I think that is, that's just an area that for me as a sheriff, um, when, when we lost our uh, captain Lauren Gunther in 2013, I knew to call Lima because that's who's handled line of death suicides here since the seventies. And I know the phenomenal people they are, but when I think about, Corey Slifko's family and uh, the South St. Paul Police Department and having their officer, you know, a, a decorated sergeant who 
um, who had some struggles, but nobody really saw it coming. Um, number one, that the shock of that. And number two, as a, as an agency trying to figure out how do you, how do you handle this? I mean, who do they go, who do they go to for help? They call Lima too, but, um, you know, we don't, that's not, that's not, they're the, the, the emotions and having worked on this podcast, that's coming up on the 26th, the emotions and the, just the whole feeling of it are, are so much different with, with the uh, suicide families. I don't there's even know how to explain it. There is. There's a stigma attached and some families don't even want anyone to know how they died. Right. Um, and we're trying to change that. Not because we're trying to invade their privacy or anything like that. It's just, if we don't talk about it, we're never going to be able to prevent it. We have to make, this nation aware that these officers have sacrificed and that the the traumas of the job that they encounter on a day-to-day -day basis um, is, is what leads them a lot of them to, to suicide not all but a lot to suicide and so that's what we're working towards is trying to help the agencies understand that and have a plan in place to one prevent them from happening have wellness checkups for your officers, you know, um, go over what the signs and symptoms are, let them know it's okay to not be okay. And, and let them know it's okay to reach out. Right. Then should they have one, the, uh, the steps that they need to take to make sure they don't have any, what are oftentimes called contagion suicides. You have to take care of your officers after um, a suicide and you have to take care of that family. And COPS does a really good job of taking care of the line of duty death families, which is why we're modeled after COPS. Right. And so we're trying to do for suicides what COPS does for line of duty deaths. Now we're just getting started and one of our biggest struggles is getting agencies to call us. One, they don't even know we exist. Right. You, know, you can put it out on every news channel on the planet and somebody's still gonna miss it and, and they don't know we're here. Yeah. So doing um, um, presentations like this podcast will help get the word out to these agencies. Uh, God willing, they, they never have a suicide, but should they, we're, we're here. Right. That you're a resource for them, you know, Absolutely. to rely on and, and to help walk them through this. Absolutely. Um, I think that's just phenomenal. So how with the, with all the civil unrest and with all the anti-law enforcement narrative and the, the reform police, refund the police, def, defund, what, uh, reimagine is the other buzz term that we're hearing in Minnesota now, or we're hearing here in Minnesota. And um, I mean, how, how does that, I mean, that, that totally increases that stress level for these officers. It, it absolutely does. It, it changes their, their daily narrative. Um, right, you know, right. you, you go to a job that, that, um, the media just keeps slamming and blaming for all of society's problems. And, uh, and these officers go, go to work every day with the best intentions. Um, do you have bad officers? Absolutely. Do you have really good officers that made a bad decision in the spur of the moment? Yes. But 99% of your officers are good officers making good decisions every single day. And I truly believe that this country supports these officers. Right. right. They're, they just don't speak up as, as much as we would hope they would, I guess. Right. But um, I, I truly believe that most people in this country support our law enforcement. Um, do we, is change needed? Change is always a good thing. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you, you stagnation is bad for any um, organization or any um, department, but to defund them and to blame them for, for all of society's issues, that's, that's, that's not what we're here about. No, agreed. You know, and, and when, I, when we talk about wellness checks, when we talk about whether, whether it's um, um, uh, annual wellness checks or, or peer support programs, 
Uh, I, I hear a lot of smaller agencies in greater Minnesota, for example, I hear some kind of off the cuff comments of like, well, that's, you know, that's, they do that in the Metro. That's kind of a Metro thing, or that's a larger agency problem. We don't have that here. And um, that's not the case. No. You know, we, uh, we have a peer support program here and, and um, we're a small agency and people utilize it. And uh, it's important that we develop a, as, as Cleos or as chiefs and law or chiefs and sheriffs in law enforcement, it's really important for us to develop an atmosphere or a, 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 a working atmosphere that, that it's okay not to be okay. You know, Absolutely. To ask for the help. Um, the problem is you still have administrators who like me were started in uh, during a time period where you didn't talk about stuff. You didn't, you know, suck it up. You just deal with it. Um, if something's bugging you, you know, it's, that's part of the job. You're just going to have to move on to the next case. And, and you just didn't, you never had that kind of support. No. Uh, so it's a complete paradigm shift as far as it, administratively, as far as thinking, um, it is. So, I mean, what can we do to better support as law enforcement? Uh, what can we do to better support these survivor families, especially these the survivor families uh, of, of suicide? Well, you know, we everybody when a, when an officer dies in the line of duty, everyone in the world knows it happens. I mean, it goes out to multiple um, media sources, pick it up and, and nationwide. Pretty much everyone hears but when an officer dies by suicide you don't hear it nobody hears about that right and right. and that's and a lot of that is due to the stigma or the shame and i and because uh, the families don't want anyone to know because they're feeling that that stigma that's attached to it and so get the families to talk about it share um take care of the families assign a liaison, just like you do a line of duty death. You can follow the steps that you do for a line of duty death and, and take care of these families. You know, we all hear about um, or see on social media where um, an officer who died in the line of duty's child graduated from high school and the entire department shows up right, for that right, graduation. Right. Those are the things that you can do for, for the surviving families as, uh, of suicide as well. Um, Remember the anniversary. Remember their anniversary. Call them on their birthday. Call them on their end of watch. Reach out to them. Have them over for dinner. Um, you know, help them uh, if they need help mowing yard their yard in in the you know right after it happens. Just any kind of support that you can give them, and stay connected because they just lost their officer, right. and they're part of the blue family. Let's be honest. Yep. They see themselves as part of the blue family. So let that blue family uh, step up and, and support that family. And don't be afraid to talk about that officer. Right. Tell the right. spouse some of the funny stories of calls they've been on and the parents. Let's not forget the parents and the siblings and the kids, um, adult children. You know, um, they've lost people, their, their, their loved one as well. So right. we've got to remember them and, and just reach out to them and, and remind them that they're still part of the blue family and you're there for them. I'm not talking, you have to spend every waking moment with them, but reach out and just Talk stay connected. So they feel that connection and that support, yep. because I can tell you when I talk with the survivors, there's a huge difference in the, the families that were supported and got an, and received an honorable funeral from the agency to those who did not. Right. The grieving process, that funeral and all of that support is part of the grieving process. Yep. yep. And, and you can just see it in their face when they talk about their agency. And so just stay connected. That's the biggest thing that I can say, just to give you a brief, um, synopsis yeah. of what you need to do is just stay connected to the families and so when with with the with the line of duty death families that i've worked with and with the the stories that we've shared on the podcast um the the general theme with these families is 
they, they, like you say, they, they want to talk about their fallen officer. They want to hear their stories. They don't want, their biggest fear is their loved one, their officer, their fallen officer, their biggest fear is that they're forgotten. Yes. And, and that's not going to be any different with suicide because with, um, I, it would be interesting. I, obviously there's no way to, 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 to know for sure, but I would assume that the vast majority of law enforcement suicides, you can relate it all back to that job. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, stressors, the stressors from the job, the stressors that the job creates for the family, um, whether it's the, the shift work or the, the sleeping issues or the, just the stress of the, of the, of particular cases. Um, and the, you know, the, the, one of the things is, you know, some turn to alcohol and they become alcoholics or they struggle with alcohol, but you have to look at the cause of that. What brought that it's, it's the job, Yep. you know, it, it's a stressful, stressful job. And Unless you've walked, you know, that old saying, unless you've walked a mile in their shoes, so, so to speak, you know, unless you've done the job, you don't truly understand what those traumatic events um, do to, to an officer's mental wellness. Right, right. And their family and their extended family. And, and their family. And, and their, yeah. The, um, you know, I, I think the one thing to, to really emphasize too is if you're an organization that helps line of duty death, fallen officer families, mm -hmm. um, whether it's, whether you help financially, whether you support that organization, if, if, if your intent to help that organization is because it, you're, you're, you're supporting the, these blue families, you're mm -hmm. supporting these fallen officers, you need to support the fallen officers from suicide as well. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, you know. and, 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 you know, that's what cops did. They, they said, we want to do something. We just don't have the capacity to take it on as an organization ourselves. So they have been hugely supportive. Our national office is actually in the cops national office. They, they've given us office space. Um, they answer the phones for us. If we need um, help with graphics or um, anything we need help with, they're there to help us. But they also helped us um, with donation to get started. Get started. Yeah. So, um, you know, they, they just couldn't take it on. And, and I, well, how many I members are they at? How many, what's their membership numbers? 52,000 plus 54,000 yeah, plus. That's incredible. Yeah. You know, you know, so it's hard to just, it's hard to imagine. Uh, it's hard to imagine managing those numbers mm -hmm. or less taking on a, a group of heroes that doubles you know, in some cases, it'll double that number. If not triple. If not triple it, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the fact so, that they recognize that and and are doing this, that just says, that says so much about national cops. Uh, it does. So, so why did you get involved? What's what's your story? Why are you why are you here? Well, I, um, I'm retired assistant chief from Columbia, Missouri. I have 21 years of service. I'm a survivor of a line of duty death, and I'm a survivor of an officer who died by suicide. And when I retired in 2014, I went to work for Concerns of Police Survivors, worked with the families of officers who die in the line of duty. That's how I got to the position of when they started talking about how they were going to help the families of, of suicide, um, I stepped up and I submitted a proposal to them to start this new organization. And um, they supported it and they voted for it. And so I resigned from COPS and Lori Putnam also resigned from COPS. And um, we started this new organization that um, connects the survivors and, and gives them hope. And we do a, a variety of things other than just um, work with the agencies. We support the families, you know, COVID, created a virtual world for us. Right. And um, we've taken advantage of uh, Zoom or, you know, um, whatever other companies there are out there, but yep. Yep. We've, t we've taken advantage of that. And we are providing um, Zoom sessions four times a month for the survivors. 
Um, and we're also having um, a spouse's retreat. It's a couple weeks away. We're really excited about that. That's awesome. Um, we're going to have a parents retreat in October. And also in October, we're going to have our first national law enforcement suicide survivors conference. We are going to provide a memorial service and a blue light vigil and a conference for these families of officers who die by suicide. They have never had that before, and we're so excited to do it. Um, you know, our numbers aren't what I thought they might be, but COVID has, uh, the increase in COVID has taken its toll, but we're going to have it. Um, if two people show up, we're going to honor those those officers. And we're going to honor any officer, whether they were 25, 30, 50 years ago, if a family member shows up for this event and registers with us, we are going to honor that officer. Uh, that is great. Where, yes. where's, the, where's the event going to be? In San Antonio, Texas. Okay. And we picked the Midwest because we thought it was easier for people to get to. And it's a little bit cheaper than a Washington DC area. So Right. So, and we're trying to, to make it affordable for them. And we're, it's modeled after um, COPS National Conference. And it's a one day conference, not two. We decided the first year we we're going to just do a one day conference and then have the other events. So we're very excited um, to, to be able to do that for that the first awesome. time ever. So, uh, if anybody who's in law enforcement knows who COPS are. That with the organization cops. I mean, we all know who they are. Yes. We all know um, just the, the great organization they have and their, 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 the experience that they have with, with uh, fallen officers. And, and uh, so for, for, for your organization to start with, with you guys coming from cops mm -hmm. and, and, and knowing, just having that, having that foundation to build on. I think that's, that's, that's huge. And we know the programs, right? We, right. we know how the retreats are run. We know what works um, and we don't have to reinvent the wheel. So it, it makes it a little bit easier for us. Right. right. So the support you're going to provide the, the support you provide these families, this isn't just for right after the funeral. This no, it's, is this is forever. Yeah. And I think that's important to share too, that, uh, um, Cause that doesn't go away with these families. I had one, uh, one fallen officer family or I was fallen officer, uh, widow who I was doing the story of her husband. And she told me that I thought, I thought this was interesting. She said that, you know, you had the funeral or well, first her husband was killed. And then you've got all these phone calls, all the media is talking about how, how much of a hero he was. And, and they're talking about, uh, you know, the event and you have, family calling and coming over and you have officers, coworkers coming over and it's all this busy activity planning for the funeral and, you know, a celebration of life and a celebration of service. You do the funeral. And then for a couple of weeks afterwards, there's still people bringing over food and, and checking on her and making sure everything's okay. And then things get quiet. Mm -hmm. And she said that, uh, she said that every day I didn't hear something from somebody was another day I felt like I was being re-victimized all over again. And my biggest fear was that people would forget. And it's natural for us as, uh, as, as being either friends or family or whatever in a, in a traumatic event like that, it's natural for us to feel awkward about approaching that family or talking with that family. You're worried. I don't, I don't want to bring up, I don't want to bring up anything that makes them upset. I don't want to, I don't know what to say. So in, instead of trying, so many people just don't say anything at all. Right. And that's the worst thing you can do. That, at least that's what the, the families have told me. And I'm sure you hear the same thing. Absolutely. You know, it, it, even if you don't know what to say, you, you can say, you know, I don't know what to say. Right. You know, you can say that to them and they understand and they, they'll, they'll help you with that conversation. But, you know, again, talking about the officer is not taboo. It's okay to talk about that officer. They want the information that right. they want to hear about that officer. Right. They, they, like you said, you know, line of duty death folks, one of their biggest fears is that their officer sacrifice will be forgotten. That isn't any different for the, uh, for the suicide families. They do not 
want their officer and the sacrifice that they that they made um, to be forgotten. Yep. And we're here to help them with that. You know, and the reality is, in the majority, it's not the 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 cops that were losing to suicide. They're the good cops. Yes. You know, they're 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 cops that that have worked the 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 story that I'm working on now. This guy was 150 mile an hour all the time. I mean, he was he was a cop's cop and um worked his way up and and was the best at every position he he did and uh um it's just a shock you know when when you lose somebody like that because on the outside that's the other thing with with uh, the, like the the suicide families on the outside everything looks like everything's fine everything's great you know i had one uh one fellow officer of, of his who said, um, you know, he had everything going for him. He had, he had the look he had, he was, he was always prim and proper and very, very military in his parents. He was very particular about how he spoke to the public, how he represented the agency, um, had a beautiful wife, two beautiful kids, a beautiful home. Um, and, uh, they didn't know. You know, there were those struggles. And, and, um, and those struggles are real. They're and, so real. You know, people understand physical pain. Right. Because everybody's at some point in their life has felt that physical pain of some sort. They don't understand emotional pain. You know, I've talked with several um, officers who have um, tried to take their own life. And um, fortunately, they didn't succeed. And they said, you know, it's not that I wanted to die. It's that I needed the pain to stop. The pain was so great. The only way I could get it to stop was to take my own life. And I, I needed it to stop. That's all I could see. And, and I wasn't thinking about my family. I wasn't thinking about, the, you know, um, the department. I wasn't thinking about any of that. I was just thinking about trying to make that pain stop. It could stop them. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, just, I just so we had a chaplain that came down from the Minneapolis St. Paul metro area she came down after the summer of the riots up in Minneapolis mm -hmm. and, and trained our chaplains came down for a training seminar and uh, one of the things that she said to them was she had spent most of the summer counseling officers who could accurately describe to her the taste of their gun barrel That's and cool. the whole room went silent you know i we none of us had ever heard anything like that before um you know and and, and it's not just larger agencies you know no. every it doesn't matter how big your agency is you know people there are people struggling and, and they're struggling all over this country. But I have to, I have to say, um, I think the awareness is increasing. The, um, the, the knowledge that the chiefs are trying to find to help these officers I, it is improving. They're trying, I believe. A, a lot of them are trying to address some of these needs. This is all fairly new. I mean, we're not talking in the last six months or anything, but Right. This is fairly new to a lot of agencies, right? But these chiefs are starting to step up. The sheriffs and the chiefs, they are, yep. and yep. I, I think we need to recognize that, that, uh, and not just say you know we're doing nothing because they're actually starting to step up and say, hey, I, I need to take care of my officers. I yep. need to take care of my deputies. Yep. I, yep. I, I, I need to take care of my federal agents. You know. So I think they're doing a better job. We just need it to be nationwide and in full force. Right. Agreed. Absolutely. So, so the, if somebody has questions about uh, the services you provide, whether it's the, the, the families or the agencies or, or the officers, just the, the, the whole package, how, what's the best way for them to find out more about your organization? They can go to our website, survivorsofbluesuicide.org. On there, they can get our phone numbers. Um, we have our cell numbers listed. They can reach out to us. And our email is there if they'd rather communicate through email. 
they can um, just give us a call or just email us something. Okay. And and we'll respond. That's awesome. So, well, thank you so much for everything you do. We, uh, it's just an area we need help in. And, um, and uh, we, we know cops and we know the cops organization and how they do things. So to have their support for your organization is, I, that's just huge. That's well, just huge. We, we came from cops, so we understand. Yeah, absolutely. Cops, you know, and we also understand that we watch those survivors get off the bus at the retreats with this look of fear on their faces and, and the terror of coming to this for the very first time. Okay, we, we saw that. Then we saw them get on the bus Monday morning, hugging everybody that they met, laughing and smiling. Now, did all their grief go away? No, but for a brief moment, that they had some relief. And now they also got support that they can take home with them. Right. They have right. new people that they can call. You know, they all exchange phone numbers. And so they have support they can call on a daily basis if they need to. Right. And so having watched that, we know it works. That's and awesome. so that's what we're going to provide for our survivors. At well, SPF. thank you for everything you do. And thank yeah. you for your service. And uh, folks, look up Survivors of Blue Suicide Foundation. Um, you can just Google it too. You'll find out. You'll find all their links. Uh, but if you know any agencies, families, um, anybody who's been impacted by a law enforcement suicide, that can, they can all use this help. They can all use the support. Um, so, so make sure you share this information with them. Also, if you're interested in more information about our podcast and the Mission of the Officer Down Memorial podcast, you can check out our website at officerdownmemorialpodcast.com and you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Thanks for listening, everybody.